Hello, and welcome to Faithful America's film discussion of the brand new documentary film, God and Country. My name is the Reverend Nathan Imsel, and I'll be your host today. And in a few moments, we'll be joined by the film's director, the talented Dan Partland, and its producer, the one and only Rob Reiner. I also want to give a special thanks to my colleague, Carly Wallace Thompson, who did a lot of the work in arranging today's webinar and, and making this discussion happen. So, as almost everyone joining knows, Faithful America is the largest online community of Christians putting faith into action for love and social justice. Together, our 200,000 voices are standing for the gospel's values of love, peace, equality, dignity, and freedom for all. This work often means taking on the twisted hijacking of our faith by the political ideology known as Christian nationalism, an ideology we see as the greatest threat today to both democracy and the church. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Christian nationalism, we have a great list of FAQ questions and resources on the Faithful America website. You can find that link in the chat. Now, the new film, God and Country, is an important entry into the conversation about Christian nationalism. From director Dan Partland and producer Rob Reiner, God and Country looks at the implications of Christian nationalism, how it distorts our constitutional republic, and how it distorts Christianity itself. The film features prominent Christian thought leaders, including many friends of Faithful America whom we've worked with on past campaigns, or you may have seen in our past webinars. The film is based in part on the book, The Power Worshippers by Catherine Stewart. You can use our affiliate link to buy the copy on uh, bookshop.org. I'm not sure there's any title I've recommended more on the topic of Christian nationalism. So it's really exciting to see this getting turned into a film. I'm going to play the trailer for the film, God and Country Now. And then we'll move right into the interview. So share screen. Did I accidentally close it? <laughs> oh, there's always a technical problem. I accidentally closed the trailer. So apologies for wasting 30 extra seconds. Oh, here we go. Share sound, share. All right, you should see the trailer now for the movie God and Country. America and Christianity are like baseball and apple pie, and we celebrate them together. I was 16, 17 years old when I became a Christian. I'm an evangelical minister. I've been a Christian my whole life. I'm a Christian nationalist. I have nothing to be ashamed of because that's what most Americans are. Is Christian nationalism Christian? Um, no, it isn't. We should be blazing forth as a countercultural example, and instead, we're leading the charge of malice and division. Christian nationalism uses Christianity as a means to an end, that end being some form of authoritarianism. Being a Christian is about the values of inclusion. Christian nationalism is certainly not based on the values of the gospel. God wants America to be saved. They're told over and over and over again that you're in danger. You need to fight if you don't want to lose your country. We are in a civil war between good and evil. This is not a movement about Christian values. This is about Christian power. What happens to the people who don't believe this stuff? We are on the precipice. God is on our side. We're taking our nation back. The thing that keeps me up at night is that we lose democracy. Does that seem possible? Yes. Christianity at its best is committed to love and truth and justice. If we do this right, what a country we will be. Fantastic. Uh, I love Sister Mo Simone saying, no, it's it's not Christian. And uh, the point that Christian nationalism is a movement about Christian power, not Christian values. I'd like to welcome now Rob Reiner and Dan Partland to the discussion. Thank you both so much. 
Dan is a veteran documentary producer and director for film and TV. He's been nominated for five Emmys, winning two with examples of his work like Welcome to the Dollhouse, The Ballad of Ramblin' Jack, and The Sixties. And of course, you know Rob Reiner. The only question is how, as a writer for the Smothers Brothers, for portraying Mike, Meek, Mike Meathead Stivic on All in the Family. He's definitely directed one of your favorite movies. Maybe it was The Princess Bride, Ghost of Mississippi, Spinal Tap. I've seen A Few Good Men at least four times in the last year alone. Rob is also a dedicated political activist for equal rights, and we're delighted to have him here with us today. Uh, thank you, Rob and Dan, both. Thank Thanks, you. Reverend Nathan. Thanks for having us. So my first question is, is for you, Rob. You've said often that the country is as divided as it has been since the Civil War. How does God and country spotlight the role of Christian nationalism in exacerbating this division? And I should have said first to everyone watching, we'll take some audience questions. Please use the Q&A thing down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can submit your questions that way. So Rob, uh, how does God and country spotlight the role of Christian nationalism in exacerbating today's divisions? Well, what uh, you know, for for many people, and you know, I'm not not your group. I mean, you people know what Christian nationalism is, but for most people in America, they don't know what it is. Uh, they assume that it's well, it's uh, you know, it's patriotic to be, you know, loving your country, and then then it's also. Uh, a wonderful thing to be able to have a great faith that you believe in. But what this does is it it puts together this idea that if you don't do what we tell you to do, if you don't believe what we believe, uh, that you don't belong in this country. And that is a very divided, divisive thing. We're now at a place in our country where you're taking elements of uh, faith and using them as a political cudgel to uh, force people to believe how you want to believe. And you'll do you'll do anything even to the point of violence. And we're seeing we've already seen the violence happen in January 6th. The reason I can connect it to the Civil War is because we had a time in our country, and this is we're far from it at this point, in which fellow Americans were physically killing each other over their beliefs. In that case, one part of the country believed that we should have a right to own slaves, and the other part of the country felt that that was not the right thing. Now we're at a point where we have started to see violence erupt amongst people who believe that this is a Christian nation and has to be a Christian nation, and all the laws that are made have to come from that. And a lot of people who don't agree with that, who are devout Christians, like yourself, uh, Reverend Nathan, who believe that uh, there should be a separation between church and state, and that the Christian values that are espoused by you and so many other uh, devout people of faith is about loving thy neighbor, helping the poor, doing unto others, and not using it as a political weapon to force other people to believe what you believe. And we are at that point in this country now where we are on the brink of having that uh, civil war occur again, unless we uh, let people know that this movement is very divisive and is not only a threat to our democracy in the country, but is a real threat to Christianity itself. And Christianity, and uh, on the on the on the the base of it, and something I espouse and believe in, is the teachings of Jesus, which is do unto others, love thy neighbor as thyself. Those are the principles that we should be uh, espousing, and they should not be part of. A, a political movement to force everybody to believe a certain thing. So that's 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 why I mean, that's why I think we're on the verge of, uh, you know, another civil war. We're we're more divided now than we've ever been, and hopefully the film will address that and show how we can come together, how we can ultimately come together. It's a great point about coming together, and you talk about forcing others to believe in, in what the Christian nationalism agenda teaches. You're you're one of those others. You're you're a Jewish man. As a Jewish yeah. man, uh, and as someone who is potentially one of those uh, 
targeted folks by Christian nationalism that would that would erase the separation of church and state. What drew you to a film about Christianity and Christians? Well, I'm 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 drawn to the idea of authoritarian. I mean, the dangers of authoritarianism more than I am about anything else. Just to, you know a little bit about me. I I am I was raised in uh, you know as a Jew, um, but a secular Jew. My family was not religious. Uh, was not uh, you know we didn't go to temple. We were very secular, um, but. When I went through a very, very tough time in my life, you know, they call the dark time of the soul, you know, where you really are searching for what you believe in. I read everything. I read books on Buddhism, on Christianity, on Judaism, on Islam, and tried to understand and try to find my place uh, in my spiritual thinking and where I was. And what I came down with was you know, oddly enough, the teachings of a person who was a Jew, which was Jesus. And those things resonated with me. The, the idea of loving thy neighbor, the idea of, uh, uh, you know, treating people the way you want to be treated, do unto others. And that's what I tried to live by my whole life. Um, so to me, this film is about getting back to that and uh, uh, not using uh, this way, the religion as 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 a, a political weapon and a and a potentially violent weapon, very violent, and not just January sixth. So much since then. So let me let me turn to you, Dan. God and country explores the implications of Christian nationalism, including those those violent implications, the way it distorts both our constitutional republic and also Christianity. What motivated you to make this film? Excuse me. Well, like Rob, I think I, you know, I started from the place of being very concerned about the state of American democracy and um, reading Catherine's book and other books um, really saw the what I think is largely the, the hidden hand behind really most of our hottest culture war debates right now. There is a an active movement that is pushing a divisive agenda. Um, so I was interested in exploring that. But you know, when you once you decide that you're going to plunge into a topic like this, I mean, as a filmmaker, you want to be fully immersed and want to learn everything that you can learn about it. And what I found the deeper I got into it was, of course, I have to understand this from a much more Christian perspective than my basic secular, you know, world that I move in um, could provide. And so, yeah, I, I tried to, you know, consume as much as I could what's going on in Christian media, what the important Christian thought leaders were. Um, and so most of the voices in the film are prominent Christian conservatives. Those seemed like the most important people to hear from. Um, and I learned a tremendous amount from them. I, I would say like immersing myself in Christian nationalism first, later hearing from um, real Christian, Christian theologians and authorities, I do understand how seductive, how attractive um, a lot of that uh, ideology is. It's not consistent with my political agenda, but once you get to the place, you know, I think I think the conundrum that that people have to really think about, people of faith have to really balance, and that people don't necessarily understand from the outside, is is all contained in this comment that's in the film from a um, prominent radio uh, evangelist in Southern California, where he says, "We don't as Christians." We don't believe in religious freedom. We believe in the truth, right? If that's your jumping off point, that you know the truth and everybody else's religion is a fake religion, right? That's, you know, why why would we tolerate people believing in these fake things? Um, I think that what America, what, the, what de American democracy, the model American democracy gave to the world was precisely to avoid this problem which is that the colonies, the settlers were endlessly at war with one another. They were mostly Christians fighting about which church, which church should decide uh, how we live, how we live our lives. And so what the great contribution of American democracy is to say, you know what, the relationship between the creator 
and each individual is a relationship of conscience and the state should stay out of that. And that really allows for pluralism. And the United States is nothing if not a pluralistic society. So, you know, before there was monotheism, there weren't a lot of wars of religion. You know, if it, when people had a lot of different gods, okay, your gods are different. I don't have that one. I have some of those and, and all that. It, it was no point in fighting about it. But yes, as soon as as soon as monotheistic religions really became the norm around the planet, we started to have significant wars of religion. And the United States was an example of how to not do that anymore, how to live the um, a life of peace and compassion and acceptance of each other that ultimately is really consistent with Christian values and, and with most of the great religions of the world. Oh, I have so many follow-ups, but I'm still going to stick to my script because I really want to get to Q and A uh, from from our from our audience. And just ask you, um, as you were researching all of that and and the fascinating points about the, the changes monotheism made, were there any discoveries or insights that surprised you, uh, particularly about modern evangelical Christians, and how did they shape the documentary's narrative? Well, the first most the first most surprising thing um, is just to it's just to do a deep dive into what Christian nationalism is like right now and what's going on in a lot of evangelical circles and in, the, in Christian conservative circles. I was familiar with the sort of 80s era um, religious right in America, um, but I really, I think we've had, you know, the luxury to not, to not track it that closely, but maybe that was a mistake. I think it it has grown in leaps and bounds. And it really, the, so the biggest, most surprising thing is always um, just just the how vast it is and how really predominant it's become in certain parts of the country. Um, that was, and how powerful it's become. It's become really powerful. I mean, I was like, Dan, I was introduced to it, uh, you know, during, in the eighties when, uh, you know, Norman Lear started his organization, People for the American Way, which was all about, uh, separation of church and state and uh, not being told this is the way you have to believe and this is the way you need to pray. Um, and so I was aware of it, but I what what I've come to realize and is that it's gotten way more powerful and way more organized uh, and way more effective than it had ha has ever been. And uh, the doctrination is uh, you know, with disinformation so easily spread through the internet, through the media, uh, people have, you know, fallen prey to it. And they, they don't even know that they've been fallen prey to it. And I think that, uh, you know, Dan has said this in the past, but we have to get to a point where we start when hopefully we move towards this more perfect union and back to pluralism and back to strengthening democracy that we'll forgive people who fell into the clutches of this political movement that was my way of the highway. We have to start forgiving these people because we all have to, you know, we're all one. We're all connected. We all have to love each other in, in a way. So uh, hopefully, you know, we can... Uh, defeat this movement not by violence, but defeat it uh, through the uh, uh, through love and the and 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 ideas, and then get back to you know a more pluralistic world that we espouse and that what America has always been about. One one of the conundrums of this of the space that uh, of trying to get my head around this and what I hope the storytelling would do is how powerful this idea is of when we tell each other, our history, how we tell our history of where we come from and what we're about. And, you know, that was one of the things that I, I did find was so persuasive when I would, when I would immerse myself in, in what Christian nationalists are saying, um, there's a, like a lot of great disinformation, there's a kernel of truth to a lot of the, to a lot of what is said about the history of the founding of the nation and the role of religion and all that. But wow, I got to a point where I, I myself was turned around. I was like, well, maybe, maybe it really was founded to be a Christian nation. I don't know. That was a good point. And that was a good point. And that was a good point. You dig into these things. And like I said, all of them have a kernel of truth, but they're substantially and easily shown to be false when you, when you explore them. Um, you know, Franklin's call to prayer is one. They will dismiss 
Jefferson's letter to the Danburys as a, um, you know, that's not part of the Constitution. The Constitution, the Declaration says we're endowed by our Creator, all of these different things. And really, when you go through one after another, there were conscious decisions at every different point in the founding to make sure that the government stayed secular. And then hearing that, I did feel validated. And that seemed really important. So the problem is that it is, ultimately is not going to be about that. We like to think that if we just tell people that, you know, America is about these things and Christianity is about these things, and then everybody will unite behind it. But unfortunately, it's not as simple as that. We have to make a much bigger sale. We have to go back and make the sale for what is great about American democracy and what is great about Christianity. Um, because the United States is going to be whatever the people of the United States choose to be. And at the moment, the United States is is wobbling in what it wants to be. Oh, two different directions we can go here. But uh, a lot of folks have been asking in the Q&A chat. So back up to the first part of both these answers, then we'll do the second part. Uh, you talked about the 80s. And, and Rob, I know you've talked about identifying this moment in the 70s uh, for the first time. Does the film track that history at all? Do you pay attention to the ways that uh, Reagan, perhaps, certainly Trump, have, have tapped into Christian nationalism? Um, and the big question that that builds to, what changed? You, Rob, you touched on disinformation. I'm sure that, that that's a big part of it, but why is it so much more salient and powerful today than it was under Reagan and the original Falwell Schlafly crowd of the 70s and 80s? Well, it, it it started even earlier than that. I mean, if you look at and and, and it is discussed in the film uh, during the fifties in nineteen fifty four, and the Brown versus the Board of Education um, created a situation where it said you you know everybody has an equal opportunity to education, and a lot of people didn't like that idea, and they didn't really uh, you know go along with that, and that became the galvanizing issue for the beginnings of this political movement of Christian nationalism, which is let's create these uh, uh, schools that uh, uh, could segregate based on religion. You know, you could have a religious school and you didn't have to allow black people to come because you could se uh, separate it out. And that became the, the rallying cry for the beginning of this movement. But it was kind of ugly. It's kind of ugly to say we're going to base a political movement on racism. You know, because that was that was the idea behind the Civil War. And, you know, a lot of people never, you know, never gave up on that. And so, OK, this is our rallying cry here. Uh, we're going to institute racism. Well, that's pretty ugly. So uh, it was kind of it didn't go anywhere. And it wasn't until the 70s, 72, 73, when the Roe v. Wade came uh, came to be that that became the galvanizing issue and much more. Uh, 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 believable for because people have real different views about that and and deeply held views about abortion or whether or not you should be allowed to or not allowed to. That became the galvanizing issue for the modern day trajectory to uh, 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 Christian nationalism. And then it built on that. It built over that to the point where uh, you had the Federalist Society uh, putting forth ju justices that would serve on the Supreme Court that would overturn Roe v. Wade. You found that as a wedge issue. Now you're seeing it a wedge issue the other way. But I mean, at that time, it was a wedge issue to move the needle towards uh, getting what the, getting what Christian nationalists want. That became the rallying cry. And we've seen it strengthen over the years since then. And it's gotten to a point now where it's it's uh, it's very strong, and we're more divided now than we've ever been. Let me ask a question for you both, and this this uh, ties on to something that both of you have also touched on so far. Rob, you've talked about a lot about addressing crash Christian nationalism through love, and Dan, you said we need to make a stronger case for democracy and for Christianity itself, not just point to the founding fathers. The biggest question, and I know several of the people in, in the film, Doug, Jamar, I'll say this too. The biggest question we all get about Christian nationalism is how do I talk to the conservative people in my life who, who believe in Christian nationalism? And I don't want to call them Christian nationalists. 
but but my uncle, my aunt, my cousin. And the questions are touching on this in so many different ways. How do I use this first? How do I use these facts? Is it worthwhile, Maria asks, is it worthwhile to engage with friends and family on social media without, how do I do this without letting my faith be co-opted? One person, I've already scrolled past it, but the simple question was simply, oh, Annalise asks, what steps can we take to defeat Christian nationalism through love? Rev, I, I'm gonna, I, Rob's going to have great stuff on this, but the first thing I want to say is that's why we made the film. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. such a converse, such a hard conversation to broach. I can't imagine how anyone, I know I can't do it. I can't do it at, at, at a family Thanksgiving. I mean, it's too sensitive. There's too many different things that have to be established and talked through in a calm way. It's, it's extremely, extremely delicate. So a huge part of our mission in, in crafting the film is can we provide a tool, you know, can we tell this story in a way that people can, you know, you have someone in your family who you think may be slipping down this road a little bit or that you would like to at least talk to them about, have you examined your thoughts about this or that, um, that you could say, can you watch this for me? That the film would provide a good jumping off point with people with, un, you know, unimpeachable credentials um, sort of guiding you and and talking a little bit about the history and a little bit of the, about the implications. He, he Dan is one hundred percent right. The film uh, aside is a great teaching tool. I mean, we have the most respected conservative uh, Christians talking about this, talking about the danger of Christian nationalism. If you share it with a friend and look at this film, I think what you'll see is. N the furthest thing from an attack on Christianity. It's the opposite. It's, it's, it's respected Christian leaders talking about the dangers of Christian nationalism and how it is hurting not only the country and not only the democracy, but it's hurting Christianity. It's hurting the faith. And, and I think if you watch the film, watch it with a friend, you can have a discussion because it's hard to refute uh, Russell Moore or Phil Vischer or, you know, David French, people who are very conservative uh, Christians uh, who are talking uh, specifically about the dangers of Christian nationalism. And first of all, to get you to understand what that means, it's, it's the opposite of an attack on Christianity, uh, the film. Christian nationalism in, in the way these leaders talk about it, is an attack on Christianity. And so that's what that's what needs to happen. People share the film with people and they'll 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 get they'll get past it. Your audience on this call is the advanced class. This this audience is already interested and engaged and understands all of this stuff. But the film, um, which I, I think would be you know valuable watching for them as well, but the film assumes that it's bringing in people blank, people who maybe don't, they've heard about it a little bit in the news. They're not quite sure what it's about or what they think about it, or they think they know what it's about, but maybe. You know. So the film is definitely geared to meet the audience where it is, whoever that is, um, and help, help launch that discussion. Uh, Rob just noted that it's Christian nationalism that is the attack on Christianity. So I can't help but think about one of the folks in the film is, um, Dr. Our friend, Dr. Jamar Tisby, uh, a fantastic scholar and Christian leader. And Tony Perkins and Michelle Bachman of the Family Research Council had a webinar last, or well, 2022 at this point, <laughs> last fall. Um, still writing 23 on my checks. And uh, they were talking about the threat of the term Christian nationalism mm. rather than Christian nationalism itself. And they said, it's this made up term to attack them. And they pointed out all the atheists who were using the term and attacking Christian nationalism. But then they also started trying to debunk Jamar and Amanda Tyler and their Christian critics, but never once mentioned the Christianity of those critics. Look at this atheist, look at this scholar. And they just, they completely erase the faith of their own Christian critics. So I think, good point, Rob, it's Christian nationalism that is the attack on Christianity. But I'm but, not the interviewee. How would you respond to that? But they're also attacking Beth Moore. Yes. And they're attacking Russell Moore. And they're attacking Phil Vischer. They're attacking people who are devout uh, in their faith of, of Christianity. So uh, how, do they, how do they countenance that? I mean, how do they come to grips with that? 
So you've said one of the ways to have, both of you said one of the ways to help talk to people about Christian nationalism is to show them this film. Uh, this is probably the biggest question at this point in the Q&A box. How, when and where can people see this? I hope this isn't our last question, but if it is, when and where can people see the film? Well, it's it comes out nationally on February 16th. It'll be in the theaters and you'll be able to find out where they are by going to the website at a certain point uh, and find out where they are. But it'll be in, around the country, all over the country in theaters. And then hopefully down the road, uh, after it has its theatrical run, it'll be on a, a streaming service. So hopefully they can see it that way. But we want as many people to see it. We're working with a wonderful group of people, uh, troops and allies who have tremendous outreach to the Christian community. And if there are church screenings, uh, people does, you know want to do a church screening and have a discussion afterwards, uh, that would be great. Anything, it's a, it's an educational tool aside from telling a great, uh, a, you know, the story of it. So let's say those churches have screenings. That would be fantastic. Evangelical churches, but progressive churches too. What, both of you, what is your hope for the film? What, how do you hope those audiences will respond in those churches and beyond after watching? Well, I mean, the hardcore Christian nationalists are, it's going to be hard to move them because they, they do believe that, uh, that violence is an answer to getting what they want. It's going to be very hard to get to them, but there are a lot of people who have, you know, gravitated towards it based on disinformation and all kinds of things that hopefully we can reach. And if we reach them, we have a chance, we have a chance of doing two things. One is strengthening, preserving and strengthening our democracy and preserving and strengthening Christianity and the true teachings of Jesus. I think we're, we're living through a time of great anxiety. You, you asked uh, moments ago, you, a little while ago, you asked about, um, well, effectively, why, why is this happening? I mean, I think that's the question for all of us to wrestle with. And it certainly had been brewing in the United States for a long time. We talked about this sort of movement that, you know, Christian nationalism has been here forever. But the question is, why does it rise up at certain times? And I think that it's rising up now for a lot of reasons. I mean, one, these kind of religious nationalist movements are rising up around the world um, because I think we're living in this era of anxiety. There's a lot of uncertainty. People feel a lot of moral ambiguity and are looking for something that answer, you know, that gives them some clear guidance and clear direction. I think it's really important for people who oppose Christian nationalism, who believe in the call of democracy and believe in the call of the true, what I think of as the true call of Christianity, to be to be um, offering that positive vision of what that looks like. And the difficulty, I think, in doing it in this moment in the United States is that we're also in the, mi the midst of this massive reckoning with what our flaws have been in the past. It's really tragic to me that um, simultaneous, you know, that in our effort to understand all the ways in which the United States has fallen short of its aspirations throughout the years, um, that it's we've lost a sense that those aspirations still were real, that those aspirations are still what we're about, even if we haven't always gotten there, and that that, that is a path. That is a path that we're never going to fully live up to, where everybody is equal, everybody's equal under the law and has equal opportunity, is able to practice whatever faith they want. But we do it well here. And people have forgotten that. And they don't, they don't believe, if they don't believe in it, I don't know how to reconnect people with their Americanness. So what I really want to do, I'd love to reconnect people with their Americanness and what's really important about this country, a model to the world. Um, it's tragic that that people feel like they need to renegotiate the relationship between church and state. Sandra Day O'Connor, late Sandra Day O'Connor had a great um, a great quote in one of her rulings that said, those who ask us to renegotiate the relationship between church and state need to answer for why we would trade a policy that has worked so well for us in exchange for something that has worked so poorly for others. Religious nationalism doesn't do well. Look around the world. It's a disaster because every country is pluralistic. Uh, democracy has to be pluralistic. When there is 
a distinction when there are different classes of people, when some people belong more than others, then you don't have democracy. The only way you have democracy is if everybody has an equal voice. And we got to get people back engaged in that and to believe that we can actually do it. We can do it in America. We do it better than anybody. And that should be at the heart of Christianity too, not just our Americanness. We believe that we, we're never going to fully get there, but we're called to pick ourselves up and keep trying every day, forgiven anew every day, the prodigal son called home every day. We get to keep trying again. Let me zero in on you. Were, you were talking about equality, and I'll note we have about seven more minutes. You were talking about equality, and that's that's so important because Christian nationalism's biggest subset is white Christian nationalism. And all too often, what Christian nationalism erases isn't just non-Christian voices or progressive Christian voices. It's the Black church tradition, with a focus also on throwing out the votes of Black and Brown voters. So from the Q&A, I want to bring in a question from one of those voices now. Leonard writes, I serve as the pastor of a Black rural church in Virginia. It appears to me that many Black people are not aware of the Christian nationalist movement or don't care. How can we change that? I'm doing all I can. Well, I think the first thing he can do is have a screening at his church. I mean, that would be the best because then he, you know, his, his, uh, you know, his followers will, will see that that's there and, and will find out that the beginnings of this movement was, uh, was racist at its core. I mean, it was racist at its core. It was an extension of uh, how the, you know, people who believe in, you know, and black people as lesser people uh, uh, glommed on to this. And they, it was the KKK, it was, uh, you know, the White Citizens Council and all those those groups that 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 latched on to this. So uh, it, it, it's a danger to the country. It's a danger to Christianity. And it's specifically a danger to people of color. Dan, would you add anything to that? Well, you've already referenced Jamar Tisby. I mean, he would be one of the great voices to look at this. I think it's it is properly called. You know, a lot of people use Christian nationalism, the term Christian nationalism, and the term white Christian nationalism interchangeably at this point. It is an overwhelmingly um, white movement. Race has been at the at the um, core of it for for a long time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that. I think that for, I'm more interested in the part that reconnects people with their Americanness and their Christianness um, than further pointing it out, because here's what I think we're, we're up against. I, I think there are a lot of good, well-intentioned Americans out there. They're, they they want to be good citizens and, and they're Christians. They want to be good Christians as well. And they're listening to their community. They're listening to their pastors. The the political talking points, the political deliverables of this political movement, it's not a faith movement, it's a political movement. The the talking points are coming to define the faith at this point. You know, it's um we need to we need to get past that. We need to get people to understand that just because you heard a pastor say it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that they're making a valid point about what the teachings of Christianity have traditionally been understood to mean. I mean, on its face, I don't understand. I mean, Christian nationalism is a, uh, you know, some of the the beliefs that Christian nationalists are likely there to believe in, they're for preemptive war, they're for the death penalty, they're against any kind of uh, limitations on gun control, they're for, they're for violence as a means of accomplishing political ends, they're against the environment. They're, um, you know, they're they're wary of of science in a lot of cases. I mean, it's not. I don't really see how any of these things are consistent with traditional Christian teaching. Where in that the fear of immigrants, even who are fleeing dangerous situations. I mean, this is literally spoken to in the Bible. Almost every one of those is um, is flying in the face of what traditional Christian teaching has always been about. And why the people that started a country uh, that weren't Native Americans who came here were fleeing uh, uh, religious persecution, specifically. So they wanted to create a country that didn't have religious persecution. And that's why they separated church from state. 
So because it's about identity, though, Reverend, as you as you mentioned, like that's that's what makes it really complicated. I mean, people is deep in people's identity at this point that they see there is a fusion of American Christianity and a certain political identity that are really, really hard to tell. Where is the end of social conservatism and where where is Christianity? Um, and, and for people who are a little bit outside the faith, I think that has become completely in, in impenetrable. I mean, it's just, where is the coherence? And so this feeling that Christians, you, you know, are maybe under, they that they feel attacked or they feel that they're not as understood. I mean, this is, this is a cycle because I think people, people outside of that world aren't understanding how any of these beliefs really are Christian. We have to wrap up. We have two more minutes and that's not enough time for the four questions I've got left. But I know the question that's being asked the most, a question, good question to end on is uh, the way Barbara puts it. How does an ordinary citizen and Christian work to defeat Christian nationalism? Karen says, give us two or three things that we can do to stand against Christian nationalism. And I know the first one, have a screening of the movie. What are two or three more things that this progressive Christian audience of faithful American members can do in their churches, families, or communities to advance equality and stand against Christian nationalism? Ask the question, are you doing unto others as you would have them do unto you? If you truly believe in what Jesus preached and what to me is the most, maybe the most important thing any person ever said on this planet, if you think that storming a capital and attacking people and trying to kill people is in the line of thinking that something that Jesus would have said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that's all, if you can live by that, and if you could talk, talk that way to other people, that's the best thing you can do and see the movie. I think you know the only I, I think the only thing I would add to that is that is that delving into this material has certainly um, really reconnected me with a lot of Christian values that I had lost track of a little bit. Um, and one of the you know the best one uh, referenced it before, but is to to love your enemies. I think you know that that's a powerful idea. And I think in this age of polarization, um, we should all really take that one very, very seriously. Because I think if we come at it from that approach, we'll we'll know how to speak to people who we disagree with, people who've done things who we don't like, and people who are on a different path. Um, we have to reconnect to our shared humanity, um, and and figure out and figure out a way forward, listening to each other and respecting each other, but ask yourself if what you're doing um, is loving, not just your neighbor, but are you are you loving your enemy? Are you finding a way to understand what they're really about, really hearing them? Our motto is love thy neighbor, no exceptions. And I'm so thrilled that you reminded us that your enemy is part of the no exceptions. We're at time. In five words or less, both of you, what gives you hope? Uh, I think, you know, there is a uh, a battle within every one of us, good versus evil. We're all battling those things. We all have flaws. We all have good points and bad points. My hope, my feeling is that good wins out. I just feel that good wins out. And that's my hope. And if good wins out, then we will keep moving forward to not only making a more perfect union, but a more perfect world. Face-to-face -face interactions, real conversations with real people. I think so much of this is happening because of how siloed we are. Um, we don't, we're not interacting. I mean, Americans, I, they never let me down when I'm face-to-face -face talking, when we're talking to each other. Um, it doesn't seem so scary that we have different political beliefs and that we think different things or that we're in different faiths. Um, uh, when you're face to face with people and really engaging um, in goodwill, out of good, in good faith, um, I think that uh, you can always find 
common ground and they're, and they're never as different or frightening or scary or, you know, as you would think, we always have a lot more in common than uh, we have uh, that divides us. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, I know we're at time. A hundred more questions we could ask. To everyone asking in the Q&A, yes, you can see this. It's live streaming on Facebook, this event we just had, which means the link will be available to rewatch within a minute or two on Facebook when we're done. We will hopefully have it up on uh, our website at some point as well. What gives me hope is the resurrection. It is the 200,000 members of Faithful America taking action, a thousand of whom have joined us today. And it is artists like Dan and Rob who take their talents and, and use them to investigate these issues, to get the word out, to, to raise up knowledge for us all and, and inspiration. Rob Reiner, Dan Partland, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank, thank you. you so much for having us, Reverend. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to everyone who tuned in.